Welcome back to another edition of How To. If you've been keeping up with this series, you know that last week I showed you a number of accessories that can go along with your scope and really help open up the diagnostic power of the tool. And I promised that we were going to look at those in more depth. Well, today we're going to start with the high amp clamp. So stick around. That's coming up next. Of all the accessories that are available for your tool, the one that most likely came with your scope was this one. It's the high amp current clamp. Why do we call it a clamp? Because it literally clamps over the wiring that we're trying to get a current measurement from. Now, how does it work? Well, basic electrics. When there's current passing through a wire, there's a magnetic field generated around that wire. This actually reacts to that magnetic field, converting it to a voltage output that your scope can display on the screen. Now, in this particular tool is a high amp clamp that's capable of measuring up to 600 amps. Uh, we're going to use that to perform a test today called a relative compression test. Now, this is a great test when you're trying to get a quick idea of the health of the engine that you're working on in the bay. No sense trying to troubleshoot a misfire in the ignition or fuel system if the real cause is a cylinder that's low on compression, even if it's only slightly low. And rather than trying to do a manual compression test, especially when you're dealing with a transverse V6 where you can, can't even see the back bank, this is a very quick test that gives you a general idea of the overall health of the engine, and at the very least will help justify the cost to your customer of having to go back and doing those manual tests to verify the problem. How does this test work? Well, this is again, basic electrics. A starter motor or any motor, its current draw is dependent on the load that's being placed on the motor. Just try this for example. Take a fuel pump motor on the bench with no gasoline, no, nothing, no fluid to pump, and see how much current it takes to turn that pump. It's very little. Now, of course, when you stick it in the tank, it takes considerably more. Well, the starter motor is the same way. Uh, what puts the load on the starter motor is first all the inertia of all that material, all that metal that it's got to get moving. But then as each piston comes up on its compression stroke, the pressure above that piston is causing more resistance to movement, and that creates momentary demands or increases in current load on that starter. And that's what we can use our scope to measure. Because we can get down to such a fine time base, we can actually see the impact that each cylinder has on that current load, on that starter's current draw. Uh, if all the cylinders are healthy, then we should see a uniform image when we get looking at our screen. But if there's one cylinder that's weak, that's going to take less current draw, we should be able to see that as well. Uh, one caution on relative compression test, if there is a cause, say a timing belt that's slightly off and the timing's off, um, that would affect all the cylinders equally, well, you're, you're going to see that too. You, you would have a low compression issue across the board, but your pattern may look okay. So that's why we call it a relative compression test. It's relative to all the cylinders involved. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So let's take the test. Okay, the first thing we want to do is get used to setting the, the tool itself. Now, on most high amp clamps, there's a simple on-off switch. And when you turn it on, there should be a battery indicator somewhere on the tool that lets you know if the battery is in good shape. Make sure you've got a good, fresh battery in the tool before you use it or your results will be affected. Uh, there is a zeroing uh, tool here that we can use to zero it on the scope once we have it all hooked up. But for my purposes, I'm really not concerned about a physical measurement. I'm looking at the variances, the changes in the amperage load. So I'm not going to worry too much about a zero point on today's test. Um, lastly, we want to check the, the scaling. Now again, this is converting current to a voltage output. And on the picoscope, which is what this tool uh, came with, there's actually a drop-down menu that I can select uh, the 600 amp clamp and it will automatically reset my voltage scaling on my scope to reflect that that calibration but the scope I'm going to use to show you this morning uh, doesn't have that feature so we have to take a look at that in this case on this uh, tool one millivolt is equal to one amp in other words for every amp that this tool is reacting to it's going to generate one millivolt of output to the scope so 50 millivolts would be 50 amps 100 millivolts would be 100 amps and so forth. So as long as I know that conversion, again, I can make that uh, adjustment and, and measure that myself. But again, because of what we're doing today, I don't even really care about that. I'm looking at the pattern and I'm looking for the changes in demand. 
All right, so let's get on to the scope. So, Pete, what's that little thing you got in your hand? Well, this is a scope, and it's actually a very capable scope. It is the uh, AES U scope. It is a little pocket sized single channel scope. It's real good for taking really quick measurements, or maybe you want to check a, a ignition event, or you want to do like we're doing here today, we want to do a really quick relative compression test. Boots up really quick, very easy to use, and that's what we're going to play with today. Uh, just to get started, uh, to show you some variances, differences in scopes are available, and uh, the capabilities that they might offer. Uh, again, apologize, there's no way I can show you every single one that's out there, but uh, we'll have some fun with the U-scope today. Okay, so we've taken a look at the amp clamp and what we need to do with that. Uh, we'll take a look at the scope and how we set the scope up here momentarily. Uh, the first thing is preparation for the vehicle. Doing a relative compression test is kind of similar to doing a mechanical compression test. We want the same kind of test conditions. Uh, I'm going to make sure that I disable the vehicle so it will not start. Uh, I'm going to make sure we especially disable the fuel system. I don't want to wash down the cylinders with gas while I'm performing the test. And I want to hold the throttle wide open uh, while I'm performing the test to, again, get that, that maximum compression pressure in the cylinder so that I can see a little better any variations there might be between the cylinders, all right? So uh, placing the amp clamp, we'll do that first. Let's take a look at how that's done. Okay, the amp clamp can be placed around, for this test, either the positive battery cables or the negative battery cables. Notice I say cables because there's usually more than one. I want to make sure I get around them all. There is a small, on uh, this tool, arrow indicating the direction of electron flow. So I want that arrow pointing towards the battery since I'm going to go around the positive side. We'll turn it on and then we'll just slide around the cables and have that in place. Now we're ready to go to our scope. Okay, now let's talk about some preliminary settings on the scope. Uh, just like any other scope, I have to set voltage and time divisions in order to, uh, to get a capture. Uh, we already decided, uh, already know that it's one millivolt for every amp. Um, yes, I may see some pretty high current spikes as the engine first starts to crank, but once it stabilizes, what's a typical working range uh, for a, a V8? Uh, 150, 200 amps. So I'm thinking I'm going to, because of the divisions, we're, we're going to go with a 50 millivolt per division setting. So it's already highlighted there. We'll make that adjustment. 50 millivolts, and then we'll move on to the time base. Now the time base, uh, again, we're looking at a few rotations. I don't want to document 30, 40 revolutions. I just want to see a couple. So uh, we've used that 50 milliseconds with success in the past on some of the other captures we've done. So let's uh, let's do that. We'll uh, we'll set that to uh, 50 uh, 50 millivolts per second, or 50 millis uh, milliseconds rather per division. Uh, next item on the list, something we haven't really talked much about, is the trigger function. Um, I'm going to get a, I want, I want just one single capture. I want to crank it up and get a pattern and then that's it. And then I want to be able to stop and take a look at it. So I wonder if there's an option for that. So we'll take a look. Yep, there's single. Uh, the next is where we start uh, triggering at. Uh, I guess I should clarify here that a trigger is really nothing more than telling the scope when to start drawing the picture on the screen. Um, so I'm looking for a single capture. Uh, right now it's set at 140 millivolts, which would be equivalent to 140 amps with the probe. Let's, uh, let's crank that down to a much lower level so that I start to see something pretty much as soon as the, uh, the key hits that run position. So I'm going to bring that down to like 20 millivolts or 20 amps. All right. Uh, the next uh, position on this menu screen is, is the slope of the trigger. In other words, are we going to catch it as the signal comes from below and, and then above 20 uh, millivolts or from above then down below? In this case, it's, uh, it's pointing up, so it's an upward slope. We're going to leave it right where it is. Uh, next menu item is inverted. I really don't uh, want that inverted, so no, we won't worry with that. That takes care of our basic scope settings. Now I'm ready to connect the amp clamp. And, uh, and run the test. So now with my scope settings uh, set the way we just set them on the bench, let's see what kind of pattern we get.
All right, uh, let's see how well you can take a look at this, but you can see that all I got was pretty much was a straight line. What's the reason for that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Number one is how I have the trigger set, and number two is the time division that I'm using to try to capture this. Uh, it looks like that 50 milliseconds isn't going to be enough to display what I want to see on the screen. But again, that's the, the easy part of using the scope. I'm just going to crank that up some more to uh, help that out a little bit. So let's go back to that menu item. And we'll crank that up to uh, from 50 milliseconds to 200 milliseconds per division. Uh, I'll reset that single capture. And... Um, you know, I'm going to see if that adjustment alone is enough to get me the kind of pattern that I'm looking for. So uh, we've got the scope set up again. Let's let's hit it again. Okay, that actually gave me something that I can work with. Now let's talk about what we're looking at. Okay, now here's a close-up of the screen showing the uh, the pattern that we just captured. Uh, notice after the, the, it peaked, and of course this is off the screen, again I'm not worried about that at this point. I'm interested in here is in the uniformity among the cylinders. How many peaks do we see here? Um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, so there's more than enough to cover all eight cylinders. And what I'm looking at here is the peaks. See how all these peaks are uniform, which is a good indication that all of the cylinders are uh, facing the same amount of resistance. Uh, typically from that compression pressure uh, and, and increasing that starter current load. So if I saw any of these that were lower, uh, like this example here, then, uh, then that would indicate a problem that needed closer attention. You know, I, I've seen, even with some of the older scopes, as little as a 10% variation in pressure uh, be reflected in this pattern. So this is a very good tool to use. It's quick and uh, helps you isolate a problem very quickly. Well, I think you've seen that the relative compression test is a very quick way to check the mechanical integrity of the engine. Uh, saves a lot of time, sure beats the heck out of doing a mechanical compression test on every cylinder. And at the very least, if I do see a cylinder that looks weak, at least I have the justification I can go back to my customer with and say, hey, you got a problem on that cylinder in the very back part of the engine compartment. It's going to take me a few hours to dig that out and see exactly what's going on. I can justify that expense though, and this is what it's going to cost you. So that's one of the good reasons for using it as well. Um, now I know we kind of threw out some new terms today, uh, triggers, trigger slopes, uh, and where we can invert the pattern and so on, a lot of other things that may have kind of thrown you for a loop, I apologize for that, we will get to those. Uh, along with another question I'm sure you're asking, if you have a pattern that looks like the one that I just showed you with a weak spot in it, how do you know which cylinder it is? Well I'll tell you what. Next time we get together, we'll focus on that. So until then, I'm Pete Meyer, Motor Age Magazine. We'll see you here on How To.